Hi, my name is Mickey Robinson, and I'm so glad and honored to be a guest here on Dreams and Mysteries. Today, I'm gonna to be sharing with you some things that I would call divine defining moments. Defining moment as a noun would be an occurrence that would happen to a person's life that would change the pathway and direct our lives in a different direction. Most people wouldn't think that being born is a defining moment. I actually don't remember that when that happened, but I do remember where I was when 9-11 happened. And if you're old enough, like me, you would remember where you were when JFK was assassinated. But I'm gonna talk about stuff that touches the strongest part of our being, that's our spiritual awareness. I'm gonna talk about supernatural encounters, angelic visitations, paranormal activity that are not coincidental, but actually were divine appointments set up by God, and visions that occurred that actually changed and altered various things in my life. And so I want you to stay and listen because a lot of our occurrences, some of them are dramatic, but some of them are subtle and we have to sharpen our awareness. So let's hang together and learn a little bit how our lives can be changed. is Dreams and Mysteries. What I'm about to tell you was during a period of time near the birth of my son, who is now 40 years old, our oldest son, where I knew for some time I had a call of God on my life and I had been, tra been trained by the Holy Spirit to learn certain things. This happened when we were sleeping downstairs in a pull-out bed that was a, a called, the room was called a par parlor. And uh, I was having a dream and I woke up in what I call a trance. And on my lap was a very large volume of like a very big book with gold trim and gold letters. And as I stared at this book and looked, the room in which I was sitting began to spin. And it began to accelerate to the point of about 10 times the velocity of a merry-go-round. And I could feel something very strong spiritually happening. And I felt if I let it go, I was going to fly away somewhere. And so I shook myself and I woke up sitting up in bed, musing over this experience. And for a long time, I felt like I chickened out. God wanted to do something and I chickened out. And a few years ago, when I was writing a book, the Spirit of God revealed to me, he said, you didn't check out, chicken out. I was putting from my library, my word into you while you were in a deep state of consciousness. How do you think you know the things you know? How do you think you say the things I say? And I was so relieved to find that out. Shortly after that, within that same week, I had a dream. And in that dream, I was standing on the porch of our farmhouse and I saw across the street, there was a transportation bus, like a Greyhound bus or a Trailways bus, and it was stuck in the mud. Suddenly I was transported over there and I was looking and the people were stuck inside, banging on the windows. I could see their mouths moving like, help, get us out, get us out. And as I looked at this scene, and I felt like somebody needed to do something. I looked, and down the other end of the, the outside of the bus was a man in a three-piece suit standing. It was an extremely well-known uh, Christian TV personality. And I'm like, I was expecting, like, he should do something because he's got all the experience. I looked at them. I looked at him. He looked at me. He looked at the bus. And finally, I just said, in Jesus' name, and before I even finished the saying the name Jesus, the windows popped open. The people were laughing like, we're free. We're out. I was stunned by just saying the name of Jesus, these people were set free. Then I was all of a sudden in a tow truck and the tow truck was going backwards down the road and it began to go faster and faster and I had to stretch out with my foot and put on the brake to stop it. And when I did, all of a sudden I was sitting up in bed and the Spirit of God spoke to me and said, when I start using you to set my people free with power and healing and deliverance, don't take it so personal that you did it because you could go backwards. The Lord was teaching me godly humility and never touched the glory of God. And that was early in my walk. And I have never forgotten it. When someone pays me a compliment or I have some kind of significant meeting or someone shares a big testimony about something happened that I played a part on. When I say I played a part, the God part is much bigger than me. Now, I'm not going to have false humility. I've been honored to serve the Lord. 
uh, in a full-time capacity for over 40 years, but I really want him to get the honor. And this lesson of moving in power and maintaining your humility is, is a stronghold, is a fortress of protection. If you're gonna have power, the stronghold of power is humility. And I learned it from the one who's the most humble person on the face of the earth, God, the Holy Spirit. And the pilot screamed at me and said, oh my God, we're going down. The airplane cartwheeled wing over wing. Visit dreamsandmysteries.com to hear Mickey's testimony, including more detailed accounts of his recovery and his supernatural experiences. I want to talk about three distinct angelic visitations that clearly were defining moments in my personal life. The first one I want to talk about uh, was I was a leader on a church in our little college town in Ohio, and I had been on a fast for several days, and I was on my way to a meeting at our church early in the morning, and it was a little bit crisp outside and uh, cold, and I passed a man. Uh, I was standing on the side of the road, and when I did, he put his finger up like this. He wasn't had his thumb out like he was hitchhiking. He just held his finger up, and he had a long coat on and a floppy hat. And I thought, you know, I'm fasting. I'm being really nice, and so I better help this person. So he got in the truck, and he sat down, and I couldn't see his face because of the hat. And I tried to talk to him, and he kind of wouldn't fellowship with me. He just gave me one-line questions, and the Spirit of God spoke to me and said, what are you going to do if this is an angel? I thought, oh, no. I just said, well, have you eaten anything? No. So I took him to a little truck place in this little uh, college town. And, of course, I'm fasting. I'm being very good. I'm drinking water. And he ordered bacon and eggs, and he ate them. And then he took a piece of bread and went around the plate like this in concentric circles. The plate was clean. He popped it in his mouth. He reached down and got out of this denim bag a little booklet, and he slid it across the table. And it had a little title on it that said, Stewardship. It was about the handling of money. And he gets up and walks out, and I go, oh, no. And I, I hurry up and pay for the bill, and he's walking down this little road, and I go, better get this guy and help him some more. And and, uh, and he gets in the truck, and he, sit, and he sits down, and uh, I said, so uh, how long have you known the Lord? And then everything changed. It's like I was in a giant echo chamber at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. He said, a long time, I, 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 I. And it was like really supernaturally enhanced. And, I was just like in shock. And I said, where do you want me to take? And he said, just take me to that first next road that's going out of town. And he got out of the truck and he left. And here, I was going to a church meeting where we were talking about building a building and money. And I I thought it was about that. And actually, it was a lesson for me that the handling of money was going to really be important in my life, a life that was lived by faith. Another uh, angelic encounter I had was really helpful. And it was really, it was somewhat dramatic. We just had returned from a ministry trip to Germany, and I sat up in bed and I could see the digital clock, and it was 3.15, and there was a man standing on the edge of our bed, the outline of a man, and it had this pulsation vibration that I could actually feel. And I turned, and my wife was sitting up, and I said, Barbara, do you see this? She goes, yes, it's an angel. And when I looked back, it was gone, but this vibration was still there. And a young woman who was a ballerina in the Christian Ballet Company, where we lived, was visiting and sleeping on her couch. And I didn't tell Barbara anything the next morning. I didn't tell anything to anybody. And she said, there was a visitor in the house last night, and I heard him go from room to room. And we were uh, having this encounter. And at the same time, we were trying to sell our house to move to Nashville, Tennessee. And uh, we had had a realtor. We advertised. And... uh, Actually, we had an experience where I actually raised the price and was going to sell it myself. And someone came to the house within two days, looked at this sign and said, oh, I will give you full price for the house, but you have to move in two days. We actually raised the price. They were coming to look at someone else's house and saw this little tiny for sale sign on our lawn. And we moved in two days, Christmas Eve of 1998. Now, that angel helped us with our real estate. So I uh, call him Homer because he helps us with our homes. Uh, another time we had uh, uh, an angel appear to us. Again, we were doing something in Germany. There must be something about Germany. We were teaching a prophetic school in Germany, and our get, our hosts wanted to bless us, so they took us skiing to Austria for a week. Now, as a little kid, even before I was a snow skier, I had looked at the TV during the Winter Olympics, and I said, 
I'm gonna ski on that hill someday. Before I was even a snow skier, and all these years had gone by and God fulfilled one of my heart's desires as a kid, and I'm skiing, and it's beautiful skiing in the Alps. And the last day we were there, Barb and I uh, and off to the side, we're at the top of this mountain, looking down at this beautiful alpine panorama, and we're just praying. We said, Lord, we just thank you so much for these people blessing us and taking us on this trip so we could ski after we did this school. And we just said, Lord, it is such a beautiful day. And as soon as I said that, this very tall, almost seven foot man came over in a bright blue suit skiing. And he came up and he goes, it's a beautiful day, isn't it? And he took off skiing down this slope right in front of us. It was like another thousand feet straight down. And I had this weird feeling, this is abnormal. So I got in my tuck position and I raced down. He stopped like he was waiting for me. And I hadn't said a word to him. And I pulled to a stop and I said, and he said to me, I just pulled up to him and I looked at him and he goes, where are you from? I said, Nashville, Tennessee. And he goes, well, that's the place to be. <laughs> and I, it just began to become stranger and stranger. I said, where are you from? He goes, oh, I'm some someplace up in the middle of Germany. And I turned, because Barbara was starting down the hill, I want to make sure she was okay. And she pulled up to me and she goes, what was that all about? And I looked and you could see for well over a thousand feet straight down and there was nobody there. And again, we were trying to sell a house. Uh, and uh, and at that time, uh, it was in the state of Tennessee and, and we could not sell it. And we went on a missions trip uh, right after we got home to South America, to Colombia, and we got there, and that night, a man walked into our house, and our daughter actually showed the man the house. He opened the door, and he says, this is God, and he paid us full price for a house that we could not give away for a certain amount of money. And again, that must have been the angel Homer. I'm just using that as a joke name, but these angelic encounters really impacted and, and changed my life, and, and sometimes they're happening, and you don't know it. Apostle Paul wrote, be careful when you're showing hospitality to strangers because you might be entertaining angels unaware. Some encounters are obviously dramatic and they stop in your tracks, but some of them you really need to be sharp to notice this is not a coincidence or that was not just a regular experience. We're all having encounters and you can have more of them and you can recognize them and it will direct your life in a path that will bear fruit. And we can get sharper at this as we learn to pay attention to the subtleties, and to the obvious things that are divine appointments. The spiritual realm is real. Whether we realize it or not, it affects things in our lives every day. The Spiritual Realm Collection equips you to not only be aware, but active in the spiritual activity surrounding us. In Introducing Holy Spirit, an audio CD, John E. Thomas teaches who Holy Spirit is in all His wonder, glory, and joy. In Naturally Supernatural, John Paul Jackson shares about many strange events, and one of them happens as he teaches. In the DVD, Interaction Between Heaven and Earth, John Paul helps you be more aware of what is going on in the spiritual realm. In The Mystery of Movement, you will hear about how the reality of heaven should affect our worship. Also included, Types of Heavenly Beings Study Card, for your gift of $65 or more, you can begin exploring these realities. Call 1-800-538-5285 or visit dreamsandmysteries.com. I want to tell a story that really, really shocked me, and I never saw it coming. Um, I had done a conference uh, to honor a, a ministry up in Spokane, Washington, and then I flew to Los Angeles to go all the way to Seoul, Korea. And when I got there, I had the privilege with another man to teach 500 of the best pastors and church leaders in South Korea. These guys had little churches like 50,000, 80,000 people. There was 500 of them, and they were so hungry. We preached. We laid, laid our hands on people. We gave words to people. It was like an honor, and it was epic, you know, and— so I'm flying back, uh, I have to go back, and then I'm supposed to go through Los Angeles back to New York and do another, do a TV thing and then do a conference. Like I must have really banged my head hard to be flying practically around the world and do three events. So my goal on this airplane was to sleep for 15 and a half hours. So I had myself all set up. I had my little airplane mask and 
noise cancellation headphones. And my goal was to be unconscious for 15 and a half hours. And there was a person next to me who got real chatty, just as the plane 747 is rolling out. And he goes, hi. And he got this cool accent. You know, it's got this English type accent. Actually, he was South African. And he begins to tell me, he says, I just came back through Bangkok and I was in India. He says, I got a business uh, over there. And he, and he says, what do you do? And I, and I had my mask on. And I said, I, I talk to people. And I put it back down. Like, I didn't want to talk to anybody. I didn't want to minister. I just had like one of the most colossal, honoring, uh, fruitful experiences. And I just wanted to sleep. And, uh, oh, what kind of talk? He says, uh, actually, he said, um, he said, I'm a teacher and an instructor sometimes. And I was a guest speaker at this big conference up in Seoul, Korea. Put my mask back down and put my head back, like no intention of talking to him. And he goes, well, what kind of people? I go, okay. I put my thing back up, put my Zero's mask back up here. I said, look, I was teaching 500 of the best pastors and leaders in all of South Korea. Said, it was such an honoring event. I said, I just can't believe I had the privilege to do that. These guys have these really wonderful ministries, and who am I to teach them anything? And he had this funny look on his face, and he stopped, and he said, Mickey, if you started with this conversation, Five days ago, I would have politely excused myself because I wouldn't be interested. He said, but every day for the last five days in a gigantic crowded street in India, a different person came up to me, stuck their finger in my nose and said, I don't know who you are, but you need to do something about your spiritual life. I'm talking about a crowded street where there's like a million people in Calcutta or something, and a different person every day for five days come up and put their finger in my nose and said, I don't know who you are but you got to do something about your spiritual life. And I went on to share my personal testimony. I shared everything about the Bible that I knew, the love of God. I, the love of God came on. I, he said, I can't believe that stuff happened to you and you're not mad, you're not bitter. And, and I just felt love for this guy. He had been in extreme sports, him and his wife. And, and the backstory behind this is that he was a fifth generation Orthodox Jew. He'd been molested by a rabbi at the Wailing Wall. So he gave up on the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or anybody like me. But for five days, every day for five days, God set someone to look him in the eye, point his finger at his nose and say, I don't know who you are, but you gotta do something about your spiritual life. And out of 400 seats on the 747, I am sitting arm's length away from him. And for the next 15 and a half hours, we laughed, we cried, we hugged, and said goodbye in LA exchanged information, and I met some people. They took me out to eat, and then I had a long layover and a night flight to New York, and I got there, and, and uh, I opened up my computer, and I was gonna check my email, and I got a note from the man. I said, hi, Mickey, it's me. I just finished reading your book, and obviously, I've given my life to Jesus because you made him real to me. I was shocked. I thought the big experience was these this big leadership conference and the honor and the privilege, but the really big experience was an ordinary me, no intention to speak to anybody, speaking to this one man that for almost 40 years, he had been hurt and wounded. And in that time, his life was changed. That was really a defining moment. I'll never forget the sound of his voice when I talked to him on the phone. I had no intentions. Doing stuff special, Sometimes you can miss, I could have missed that opportunity to touch this life that God had so carefully orchestrated. I could have just said, I'm too tired. Uh, I, I need to take care of myself. I just need to eat and go to sleep. This person God loved so much, he arranged that whole thing as much as he arranged those 500 pastors. God loves every single person and he will set you up to change the world. There are moments in life when we need God to move in power. In times like these, we need Breakthrough Faith. For your gift of $45 or more, you'll receive these teaching CDs, Storms, Faith and the Miraculous, How God Kills Fear, Healings and Measures of Faith, as well as Where's God When Life Doesn't Turn Out As Planned. Visit dreamsandmysteries.com or call 1-800-538-5285 today to request your Breakthrough Faith series. My wife and I, uh, we had all this long desire to go to Israel. We had a love for Israel. We have friends there. We were blah, blah, blah. And so someone's going to pay for us to go. 
with this group of people for worship intercession on location. So we're going to make it like the time of our life. We're all packed up. We've got special stuff. I'm going to meet my friend over there and do a healing meeting. And Barbara's going to dance at the Feast of Tabernacles. So we're going over all excited. We we get there. We The first people through customs, we're all excited. And we're on this bus, which hasn't moved. And Barbara recognizes some people coming through the gate. She wants to go say hi to them. She's just all excited. And she's going off this step. And the guy parked next to a big curb. It was about this high off the ground. And her ankle slipped. And she stepped. She went right through midair and went down and snapped her ankle and broke it in about 10 places. We're whisked off to the emergency room in Tel Aviv. And they do x-rays. And the foot was actually twisted and going in the wrong direction. And I'm confused. I'm out there praying, thinking, God, I know that this was you. There was confirmation. And what should I do? What should I do? And the Holy Spirit says, you're her husband. Take the best care of my daughter that you can. And I walked back in, and Barb had been praying with a young gal that we had led them to the Lord in America with their they were, uh, Israelis. And she was an evangelist, and she was praying with her, saying, Lord, I don't want to leave. I want to be here. I can worship you in a wheelchair. I can go to the healing meeting and get better. She says, please, just, just let me stay here. And, you know, the thing was that she was going to need an operation. She was going to be in the hospital for a week. They are going to have to put a metal plate in there. And I walked up to her, and her face, it was like glowing. Like, she never looked so beautiful. I said, honey, I've got to take you home. She was crying. She said, that's the very thing. I didn't want to do, but I told the Lord, I'll do whatever Mickey says. And so all of a sudden we go, they take her on a cart. We're going through the airport. She's, she says, we got to get some stuff for the kids. We got to go to the gift shop. There she is. She's on this gurney. They load her up on the airplane on a, and the food uh, elevator. And they took four seats out of the airplane. Somebody had to pay over $8,000 for us to go home because they took four seats out. They had this curtain around there, like a Muppet show and all these Jewish people were thinking that she's some kind of blonde movie star having this luxury place. <laughs> and she has this cast on her leg and get to back to Texas and take her to the hospital. And I get to a little hotel. I didn't want to tell our kids that I was home because we were in Israel for less than 12 hours and flying back home. Now, who is that? We're either CIA, we're, we're terrorists, or we're drug dealers, or we're diplomats. <laughs> and I was like spinning around. So this is how you beat jet lag. You just rewind it real fast. And... Uh, I wake up and we have to go home and she has to keep her foot elevated above her heart for the next six weeks. They put a steel plate in her ankle and put nine screws. They put this bone, broken bone back together. And here am I chasing four children around the house, trying to be Mr. Mom. It was driving me crazy. And everybody's sending her pictures and gifts and cards from all over the world. Barbara, we love you. And, and you were worshiping for Israel where well, you Israel was too hurt to even worship. You're, the, you're saying all these nice things. Say, Pray for me. I'm having a nervous breakdown. I was so stressed out. I was freaking out. And finally, she got good enough that I could go somewhere. And I'm on an airplane flying to this really cool place that I'd never, I really wanted to go to this church and do the, their, their very special meeting. And I had been so unprepared. I was so wired. And then I had this vision. And I saw this little man about this big at a distance but I could hear his voice crystal clear and with this whiny wheezy little voice he says you're not prepared you're not good enough he had a court gesture suit on with the little thing with bells on he goes you're not good enough you're not ready you're not ready and then I saw a uh, I had a vision of this and then I heard the Lord say when you sense the presence of the enemy look for the table for God sets a table before you in the presence of your enemy. And I saw this little card table on it was a paper plate and a little old toasted cheese sandwich and that just dissolved. And suddenly I was sitting at a king's table and this invisible guide says, and it was filled with all these golden plates and candelabras and, and the best food in the world and says, he says, whatever you need, whatever God sets before you, that's what you need. Do not focus on the voice of the enemy. You focus, you need to be at rest and look for what God has placed right before you. When you sense the presence of the enemy, look to see what God wants to do. If you listen to the voice of the enemy, it'll get louder and he'll grow bigger. He is just a fallen angel. He is like a ventriloquist looking for a dummy to speak through. Don't ever repeat what he says. Look for what God's saying and you'll be blessed and you'll be taken care of. 
Strengthen your faith and focus on amazing things God has done with the Heavenly Encounters Package. You will find stories from Mickey Robinson and John Paul Jackson that tell about their heavenly encounters and powerful testimonies. In Falling Into Heaven, a book by Mickey Robinson, you will read the captivating account of the horrendous accident he experienced and the ensuing encounters with the presence of God. My Journey So Far is a two-CD set of John Paul sharing his testimony, from his mother's supernatural 11-month pregnancy to multiple miracles that drew him into God's plan for his life. Seven Days Behind the Veil is a devotional that draws you into the biblical picture of heaven, a very different picture than many have had. For your gift of $60 or more, you will receive all three of these hope-filled testimonies of the supernatural activity of God in the earth. Visit dreamsandmysteries.com or call 1-800-538-5285. I guess it would be an honest question about life. Is what we are what we were? Or can we really change? Can these influences from God transform our lives? It really depends on the source. When the source of the influence is from God, and we would choose to ask for the grace to cooperate with God, I believe that transformation is God's desire not just at one moment at the beginning when we come out of darkness into light and then we coast on that experience, but we continue to experience God, to communicate with God, to recognize. Now, a lot of these, a lot of the experiences are very subtle and you gotta really peer into it and realize this was not just an accident. This was a God setup. And then learn from that experience. You can pray and ask the good shepherd and he really is a good shepherd to sharpen your awareness, sharpen your alertness, and learn how these moments, whether they're subtle or whether they're really life stoppers, that you will flow with God and be changed and transformed until we look and act and sound just like Him. Whatever God has for you is preparation. You're not to listen to that voice. If you listen to that mocking voice, the second voice is usually the voice of the enemy. Like when Jesus was baptized, the heavens opened and God said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And when he became hungry after fasting for 40 days, the enemy pretending to be a spiritual guide said, if you are the son of God and prove it to me by changing these stones into bread. And Jesus said, I don't live by bread alone, but every word that only comes from the mouth of God, my emphasis. God wants to use you. He wants to give you opportunities. Don't be afraid to step out because this small thing could be a great big door to open up to a new room for someone else's life and yours as well. God loves to use us and he loves to surprise us. He doesn't th hide things from us. He hides things for us to find. It's been going on in my life and I want my defining moments to be the best now and in the future. I want to finish well and God wants you to and he can use ordinary people like you and me to do extraordinary things because he loves people that much.